Hi. In this video I'm going to share some of my experiments with the Pi Pico transmitter. In the last video I demonstrated how a Pi Pico and a few external components could be used to generate radio signals using the PIO as an oscillator and an analog switch as a simple mixer. The signal power was around a milliwatt so to make this into a practical transmitter it needs some kind of amplifier. There are a couple of ways we could go with this. With single sideband the traditional method is to use a linear amplifier. A linear amplifier faithfully reproduces the amplitude, phase and frequency of the input signal. The only real downside of this approach is that these amplifiers can be relatively inefficient. The class E amplifier is a very efficient class of amplifier that can achieve efficiencies of more than 90%. This is great for portable battery powered equipment, reducing the cost and weight of batteries. The downside of the class E amplifier is that it isn't at all linear. It entirely removes the amplitude information from the signal. To work around this, it's possible to use polar modulation. A class E amplifier is used to reproduce the phase of the signal, and another amplifier can restore the magnitude of the signal by modulating the power supply of the class E amplifier. Polar modulation is an idea that I find very interesting, so this is the method that I'm going to try now. There are a couple of reasons why the class E amplifier is so efficient. The first is that it doesn't operate in the linear region. It's designed to be either on or off. When a transistor is switched off, it doesn't dissipate any power at all. And when it's turned on, it dissipates very little. Only the losses that occur in the small internal resistance. Another source of loss is the parasitic capacitance of the transistor. During each cycle, the transistor has to charge and discharge this capacitance. The energy stored in the capacitor is wasted as heat. The Class E amplifier combines the parasitic capacitance with other capacitors and inductors to form a resonant circuit. Instead of wasting the energy stored in the capacitive and inductive component, the energy is stored and acts like a spring, causing the output voltage to bounce back to zero of its own accord. The component values are chosen so that the voltage returns to zero shortly before the transistor switches on. This means that there is no energy in the output capacitor when a transistor gets switched on so it doesn't get wasted. Now let's talk through the circuit. It roughly divides into two parts. The first is the Class E amplifier itself, and the second is an impedance matching circuit. The main switching element is a single N-type MOSFET. The gate of the MOSFET is driven by the RF input. This should be a square wave with sufficient voltage to turn the transistor on fully. The DC power is fed through an RF choke. The value of the choke isn't critical, but it should be quite large to allow DC current into the circuit but appear as a high impedance at RF frequencies. The output capacitance of the transistor is combined with another parallel capacitor. This then forms part of a resonant circuit. This resonant network includes a series inductor and capacitor. We've designed the amplifier to have an output of 5 watts at 12 volts. This means we have to have a load impedance of about 8 ohms. In practice, 8 ohms isn't particularly convenient, and transmitters nearly always have an output impedance of 50 ohms. A Pi impedance matching network means that we can make our 50 ohm load look like an 8 ohm load. A capacitor is connected in parallel with the inductor in the impedance matching network. The capacitor and inductor form a notch filter at the second harmonic frequency. This gives some extra attenuation to the second harmonics which tends to be quite high in Class E amplifiers. OK, so let's have a go at building a Class E amplifier. Class E amplifiers have a reputation for being quite tricky, but there are some handy spreadsheets around to help you work out the component values. In the description, I've added a link to a spreadsheet that's been used quite widely. For convenience, I've taken the equations and put them into a Python script to calculate the component values for every band. It's based on the spreadsheet, but works out the nearest capacitor values, as well as working out the number of turns needed to wind the correct inductance. In the real world, there'll be other parasitic capacitances and inductances, so the component values are more of a starting point, and will probably need to be tweaked. I built the Class E amplifier on a fresh board. I've designed it for the 20 meter band to start with, and I'm working with the center of the band frequency being 14.175 MHz. Before I connect it up, I'm going to look at the response using a nano VNA and make some tweaks to the inductors. You can see the second harmonic notch, 
Initially the frequency was much too low. I tried spreading out the inductor to increase the notch frequency, but in the end I had to remove one turn to position the notch correctly at 28 MHz. Once I was happy I added some hot glue to the inductor coil to hold it in place. The output of the Pi Pico isn't strong enough to drive the MOSFET directly, and the voltage isn't quite high enough to ensure the transistor is fully turned on. I used a tried and tested technique to drive the MOSFETs using three 5 volt logic gates in parallel. These are capacitively coupled to the MOSFET gate, which allows us to add a DC voltage to make sure the transistor turns on fully. This doesn't increase the voltage swing, so we need to be careful that we don't add so much voltage that the transistor doesn't turn off fully either. Let's give the circuit a try. I've used a bench power supply to output the 12 volts. From this we can see that we're consuming about 5.1 watts of power. Looking at the output on the scope, the RMS voltage measurement is just over 15 volts, which is slightly less than 5 watts into a 50 ohm load. I think that the measurement error is fairly significant, so I don't think that in the real world the efficiency is as good as the measurement suggests. The body of the MOSFET is noticeably warm, but it's not getting really hot. I put a thermocouple on the MOSFET and left it for about 10 minutes or so and the temperature levelled off somewhere in the mid 40s. The dummy load is just a homemade one. I've wired together lots of resistors in parallel to give me a 50 ohm load. After a few minutes of running the dummy load is giving off quite a bit of heat. There's a smell of hot electronics and it's very easy to believe that this is dissipating 5 watts of power. I'm quite pleased with this result. The Class E amplifier seems to be behaving as advertised. It's generating a useful amount of power quite efficiently it looks like we could probably manage without a heatsink. The gate and drain waveforms look about right too. I can see that the drain voltage in yellow is dropping to zero around the time that the gate in blue switches on. Now that we have an RF output we need a way to modulate the amplitude. We really want this amplifier to be as efficient as the class E amplifier so using a class D audio amplifier is the obvious choice. This is the simplest way I can think of to make one. I've used a standard MOSFET gate drive to amplify the PWM output from the Pico. This gives us a 12 volt swing and a much stronger drive capability. This feeds into a MOSFET half bridge. I've used a P-channel and N-channel pair to simplify the drive requirements. The output filter is a simple LC low pass filter to remove the switching noise from the amplifier. I'm running the PWM at nearly 500kHz. I'm trying to run it as fast as I can to limit ripple, but this may also have an adverse effect on the efficiency. We could potentially reduce the ripple even further by using a higher order filter. So let's see how that works. I'm transmitting a single tone in AM mode so I can see what's going on more easily. The output of the half bridge just looks like a more powerful version of the PWM output from the Pico. Once we pass this through the output filter, we end up with something that resembles a sine wave. This is the power supply to the Class E amplifier. If we now look at the RF output, we can see that the envelope modulation is working nicely, giving us something that looks like an AM radio signal. Now, let's switch back to single sideband and see how that sounds. Lazy dog, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. I'm quite pleased with the way this sounds. I don't think the amplifiers added much in the way of noticeable distortion compared to the unamplified signal. Before we can use this on the air, we need to consider the quality of the output. Although the signal sounds reasonably good, we need to make sure that we don't cause any interference on other frequencies. I converted my dummy load to act as an attenuator, and I've connected this up to the tiny spectrum analyzer. The good news is that the second and third harmonics have been very well attenuated by the resonant filtering networks in the Class E amplifier. The second and third harmonics are well within acceptable limits. What's more concerning are the spurious outputs a couple of megahertz away from the fundamental. These spurious signals are 30 dBs below the fundamental. Although that's a fairly weak signal, only a few milliwatts, it's still too high to consider using a transmitter on the air. I've done some investigations and I've confirmed that the spurious signals are caused by the periodic frequency corrections applied by the Pico software. If I choose a frequency with a period that's an exact number of clock cycle, the spurs go away. 
The corrections cause spikes in the frequency spectrum because they have a periodic repeated pattern. A common way to work around this kind of problem is to add phase dither. If the phase corrections follow a pseudo-random pattern, the corrections appear as noise spread up across the spectrum rather than spikes. I've done some experiments with phase dithering, but because I'm using pre-generated waveforms it makes it hard to make the phase corrections sufficiently random. Another option would be to add some extra filtering to the output. The difficulty here is that the spurs are very close to the fundamental, so we would need to make a high quality filter that might be difficult to build and would potentially be quite expensive. I think that it's probably better to explore some other approaches to the phase modulation. There are a few different ways we could go. One option is to use a PLL to generate the clock. Most QRP designs are using a SI5351 chip. These are fairly inexpensive devices, so it wouldn't make much difference to the overall cost. One idea is to use the PLL to generate a clock that's an exact multiple of the output frequency. If we use this to clock the Pico, it would remove the need to add periodic frequency corrections. I think it's likely we would still get some spurious outputs if we modulated the phase using the PIO though. Another option is to modulate the phase by sending frequency updates over the I2C bus. This is the way that the micro SDX transceiver works. I think that there might be some advantage to clocking the Pico and the PLL from a common source though. Yet another option would be to use the more traditional approach of a quadrature sampling exciter. So, we've shown that it's possible to build a transmitter using the Pi Pico and a few simple parts. Although the spectral quality of the PIO based oscillator isn't as good as I would have liked, I've still had a lot of fun building this transmitter and I've learned quite a lot along the way. We've developed quite a few useful components too. We've developed an efficient modulator design that can generate single sideband using only about 10% of the CPU on a single core. That leaves quite a lot spare to implement some exciting features. It might be fun to see what kind of digital modes we can implement using the spare capacity. We've experimented with some efficient polar modulated amplifiers and the results look quite promising. I think the Pi Pico is a really good basis for an inexpensive transceiver and with a bit more work it should be possible to build something pretty decent at a reasonable cost. I really love working on this kind of project so I'm certainly going to carry on experimenting with these designs. I've also got a lot more projects that I'd like to build and share. So if you've enjoyed watching these videos and would like to see some more projects Keep an eye out for updates. Thanks very much, catch you next time.